want to thank Tina Schumann and Michael Schmelzer for coming all the way out to Orcas Island to talk with us today. And um, I'm going to give just a very brief introduction of Tina and Michael, and then uh, and then and then kind of introduce what our topic is. The two of us, or the two of them, will talk. Um, answer embarrassing questions that I pose to them, and um, and I'm going to put them on the spot and ask them to read some poems, and then we'll have a little Q and A. So we'll open up the discussion to all of you, and so um, I'll just go right down the line. So Tina Schumann is a poet from Seattle. She has several books out and the latest of which is from Red Hen, Praising the Paradox. She has won many awards and accolades and is really a great advocate for poetry also. And one of the reasons that I really was excited about her being here and talking about this topic of what does it mean to have a voice in America as a poet is because Tina has a really interesting background of having parents from different countries and including a parent who came to this country and so she grew up with an immigrant mother and had that experience of kind of having a foot in two different cultures and having the advantages and disadvantages of that as an individual and as a writer. And Tina also is the poetry editor for Wandering Angus Press, and so she also has this not just, you know, as a writer, but she wears this hat of looking at giving voice to people and, you know, looking at what are the, what are the things we want to publish that will be of interest to others and are saying something new and interesting as, as a poetry editor. And Michael is, has some correlations. Michael is also an award-winning poet with many books out and has um, also acts as an editor and publisher with Floating Bridge Press. Michael grew up the first half of his childhood in Japan his mother is Japanese. His father has German heritage, right? Mm -hmm. Do I remember that correctly? And so Michael grew up with the advantages and disadvantages of then being in this country uh, as an immigrant, as the child of, of parents who are from two cultures, one of whom is an immigrant. And having to both Michael and Tina having to act as bridges for their parents in this new world because maybe they're a little more acculturated as, <coughs> as youth learning the language a little more easily, a little faster. And so um, they, they have had this really interesting perspective. And so anyway, um, we'll hear more about all of that, but please welcome Tina Schumann and Michael Schmelzer. <laughs> The topic um, and the inspiration for today's conversation for National Poetry Month actually came from Twitter. <laughs> I'm embarrassed <laughs> to admit. <laughs> and I saw in January, I saw E.J. Ko, the poet E.J. Ko, who had just been awarded a National Endowment for the Arts um, uh, Fellowship in Literature. And she was really excited about it and was thanking the NEA. And then she said, and I'm, I'm just going to read what she wrote. After hanging up the call with the news, I had to translate for my mother not only what it meant to me, but what it meant to her. I found these words in Korean. It means you don't have to worry about me anymore. <laughs> It means that our voice, excuse me, it means that our stories, we can be a part of the world. 
Well, that just brought tears to my eyes as soon as I read it. Uh, to believe or worry that your story can't exist in the world or doesn't have a place in the world is an awful thought, you know, as a writer especially. <laughs> and um, so I thought about that quite a bit. And then Sam Gailey contacted me and said, hey, what do you think about doing something for National Poetry Month? And I said, Sam, I, I have an idea. <laughs> and I even have an idea of who I'd like to invite. <laughs> And so, so um, this is what we're going to talk about today. And I, want, I do want to talk about this idea of stories in the world. But before we do that, I want to talk about the idea of belonging. And it, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot here. And, and I'm going to start out in some places that are pretty emotionally sensitive and emotionally rich and certainly culturally rich with this idea of what does it mean, first of all, to belong in the place where you live. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to start off uh, answering a little bit about that. So I, I have a, a different kind of uh, relationship with the idea of belonging. So I, I never exactly felt uh, like I belonged in Japan per se. Uh, being biracial, I was never quite 100% uh, anything. I was wholly who I was, but not 100% this or that. So I felt very much um, kind of in between worlds in a way. And then after moving uh, to America, we moved to Minnesota, and that's where my dad is originally from. Um, I also still felt that sense of not quite belonging in America. There's a lot of um, kind of displacement that I felt just wherever I kind of was at. And so for me, the idea of belonging and home really was centered around family. Like it was very much centered around me, my brother and my parents. It felt like, you know, whether it was being on the Navy base and my dad would be gone for nine months at a time or being in Japan and being in America and all these different things. It just felt like wherever my family was, that's where I could find some kind of centering of self. Um, so I don't really have a very strong sense of belonging anywhere, per se. Mm -hmm. um, writing was a means of expression, of course. And I think if I look back on kind of why I began that, it does kind of find its roots in my parents, like my mom would always speak Japanese in front of my friends when I was growing up, and that had to do with her embarrassment over her accent when she was trying to speak English. So she would mm. always speak Japanese to me, and it was kind of both her embarrassment at her own accent and also maintaining that cultural sense of identity for me and for herself as well. So I think belonging is really complicated. I still don't necessarily feel a sense of like strong belonging to anywhere but within individuals and within like my family or within close friends. So it's not so much a geography so much as just relationships, I guess, for me. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I'll tag on to that too. I think it's pretty much the same for me, but we moved around a lot and my dad was not in the service. It was just a, a general dissatisfaction, I think. Um, <laughs> but I grew up mostly in the Bay Area in the 1970s. And the school I went to in my neighborhood was we were ethnically blended before it was even, you know, it just was. I had Chinese American friends, I had Japanese American friends, I had African American friends. We didn't even, it just was where I was. But because we moved around a lot, it had a lot more to do with being with family. And I'm the youngest of five. My mom had two sons, one who's full Salvadorian, and then my dad's first wife was Japanese, so I have a brother and sister that are half Japanese. So we were all together and, you know, I was the youngest and I took it as a fact. This was who my family was. I don't think I was even aware that my mom had an accent or was from somewhere <laughs> else until I was probably, I don't know, 10 or 11. And it got pointed out by someone else with, your mom talks funny. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started to realize that by extension, I was going to have to be explained and you know, understood in that way. But yeah, it was much more about feeling that comfort of with family instead of a place because we moved mm. around so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 
Well, that's interesting, and I, I wonder, you know, I think the psychologist might say that belonging in general is more about the people than the place, but if the people mm. of a place mm. don't mm. accept you, then maybe that makes that the need to belong within a family unit all the more important and profound. I don't know. Yeah, I think my mom felt more disjointed than I did. I felt like an American kid. Yeah. But um, my mom was, you know, one foot in El Salvador and then one foot here. Yeah. But she came here at 14, so she had a lot of years to assimilate. Mm. And of the, she was the youngest of five sisters, and she was the only one that didn't lose her accent. The older sisters yeah. worked really hard to lose their accent. It was important to them to not be recognized as that or not have it held against them or not be mm -hmm. embarrassed. And, um, you know, yeah. in the book, I talk about, this is the collection I edited called Two Countries, which Michael is in, um, about growing up with uh, an immigrant parent or grandparents. I talk about the fact that um, what I would see growing up is if we were at the grocery store or the bank and someone heard her with an accent, they would either be enthralled and say, oh, I love your accent, where are you from? or they would start to talk slower and louder. <laughs> and the assumption was, you must be dumb. <laughs> you must not be able to hear me because you have an accent, which mm. didn't somehow make sense to me. Mm. But I never reacted to it until I was probably 18 or 19. And I finally looked at a bank teller and said, she's not dumb and she's not deaf. Mm. And my mom, you know, oh, don't do that, Tina, let's go. And oh. she wouldn't. You know, she wouldn't make a big deal out of that, but she was kind of used to it too. Yeah, and I don't think it's something you should have to get used to. But yeah, yeah. that's interesting that you became her defender in a way mm -hmm. too. Not just at times, perhaps her translator or somebody who kind of eased well, things. Well, I didn't but, have to translate for her. She spoke three languages. She spoke French and mm -hmm. Spanish and English, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know that was never a problem. Mm -hmm. um, it was telling other people. Mm, yeah, don't make don't assumptions about her mentality yeah. or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that um, that maybe makes a good segue to, um, to ask you to read this poem. And I want to thank you, Tina, for letting us. Is it okay if I? Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is actually a poem of Tina's that has not been published. So you're getting it firsthand. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have a few copies for people who might like to read it. I don't think there are enough for everybody, so if you can share. And I'll just pass that around. And, um, and this is Things My Mother Told Me, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so go it's, ahead. It's pretty new, and I have to say at 58, I'm getting to a place where I can write about mom without <laughs> the other mother-daughter stuff coming into it that has nothing to do with her being an immigrant. <laughs> Things my mother told me. While standing at the bathroom sink, putting on lipstick, wiping steam off the mirror, she said at the center of her father's home was a courtyard of tra tropical plants and birds. All the rooms were built to face the courtyard. Every morning, a maid dressed her while she slept. She did not dress herself until she was 14. Black beans, queso fresco, and fried plantains made up her childhood breakfast. Coffee, black as oil, milk still warm from the cow. When she was five, she contracted lice and her head was shaved. The family chauffeur was kind to her. She recalled him fine, fondly. The French Dominican nuns at her parochial boarding school made her say, oui, mademoiselle, and non, mademoiselle. All the girls bathed communally with their underwear on. They pin curled each other's hair before bed. While driving me to school, rolling down the window to expel smoke from a Salem, she once thought she was in love with her cousin. Her dog was killed by a car. She wanted to be a ballerina. Her father, Narciso, was named after a flower. His sudden death from a burst appendix was the worst thing that ever happened to her. The state rooms on a United Fruit banana boat that bought her to her mother in the U.S. were given gratis from the company for her father's service. Her 63-year-old grandmother accompanied her on the trip from San Salvador to the port at New Orleans, where a week-long trip to San Francisco awaited them. Her mother once smashed a window down on her fingers 
when she caught her sneaking out, sneaking in after a night of clubbing. At 18, when sunbathing on a California beach, a Hollywood agent gave her his card. She never called him. While sitting on the edge of the tub teaching me to shave my legs, she contracted tuberculosis in her 20s and returned to El Salvador for treatment. Her aunts proclaimed her to be skin and bones. In the 1950s, her boss at the Bank of America would drop the keys to the vault on the floor in front of her as he could not risk touching a dirty spick. She gave up her infant son to her first husband when he asked for a divorce, and that was the condition. He would tell the child she was dead, she never saw him again. While pregnant with my brother, she tried to throw herself from a moving car when her married lover said he would not be leaving his wife. She stole bathing suits from Pick and Save for me and my brother one sweltering summer when she could not afford to buy them. Her advice to me on romance, it's just as easy to fall in love with a rich man as it is a poor man, and never say, I love you first. <laughs> Mm. Thank you. Thank you. I think about that, like the stories of, you know, of, of our families, of our culture, and and how do those shape us? And um, uh, I, I, I want to ask Michael if you would read a, a poem. Uh, this is from your book, Blood Song, Inherited Music. M uh, Michael has no idea what I'm <laughs> He's like, what are you asking me to read? I didn't tell him I was going to do this. But So just to give you an idea of what a good sport both of these <laughs> poets are, I'm just like throwing poems in front of them. Read this, please. Um, uh, Inherited Music is, is a poem that, um, well, I don't want to say anything about it. I'll just let you read it, and I'll pass these copies around. Inherited music. Because gray clouds gorge on themselves, we intuitively know rain will be the byproduct. Below them, starving palominos stomp the fallow field. If you believe the stories my mother bequeathed, then you trust the shrinking skin against their further protruding ribs composes an eerie music, a lullaby with ominous lyrics. It explains why she so often crept to the barn and fell asleep beside these creatures while they stood lock-kneed and slumbering. Somewhere in their stomachs, a song you'd only sing at a child's funeral. I never heard it, nor did I hear my mother speak repeatedly about her mother dying because I was deaf with youth at home, she nearly faded into the beige sofa. A lit cigarette abandoned itself to ash. There's my mother leaning into the frayed corner of a throw pillow, and I enter the room brashly, asking about dinner, singing a stupid song I just heard on the radio. Thank you. Oh, so this, to me, these poems really speak to what I imagine E.J. Coe was talking about with that idea of now our stories can live in the world, that you each have this legacy of, you know, of what your mother told you and these inherited, this inherited music, these songs. <coughs> And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about like the, the, the influence of these cultural and familial songs on your own songs, on your own poetry. Well, I think uh, for me, my first like kind of love of language kind of began with, it was a combination of my dad always listening to music at home and was always listening to, like the doors and the beatles and all that so there's that sense of musicality and sense of like lyricism and all that at home all the time um he was uh in the navy for like 20 years and then worked uh like security at a nuclear plant so he wasn't um 
what he would consider an artistic person or a creative person, and neither was my mother. She uh, didn't graduate high school, but like I feel like Japanese high school is pretty much like you know extremely high level of <laughs> kind of merit and all that, anyways. But so they're both extremely bright, smart people, but just not in the sense of like educated, let's say. And so I don't think either of them thought of themselves as creative types or artistic types. And I'm mm -hmm. kind of the outlier in the family. Um, but I think my love of language and trying to capture that, especially writing in English, I think is very much influenced by, like I said, my dad listening to so much music and being a lover of that medium and my mom not having a full grasp of English and kind of compensating in my own way um, I would have never have known that, like, younger, I wouldn't have thought of that, but I think now it makes sense that, in so many ways, that's what I was trying to do, is kind of preserve and master language in a way where I can kind of preserve our own little family histories and stories mm -hmm. and things like that. So it's not exactly, it's almost like influenced by negation, I guess, would be <laughs> kind of a way to phrase it. So I think that's kind of how I kind of fell into poetry and really concentrating on language and putting it together and taking it apart. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Tina, for you? Yeah, um, well, I was thinking about that line, I was deaf with youth. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I grew up mostly around my mom's family. My dad's family's from New Jersey. And so my grandmother and her sisters and her cousins were, Spanish was around me all the time, and I just blocked it out. Um, she could have spoken to me, in fact, she tried, to speak to me in the home, and I would always answer her in English. So it wasn't forced on me. I kind of wish I was bilingual, bilingual now, but they were both big readers, and there was always poetry on the shelf, and Walt Whitman was God as far as Dad was concerned, and <laughs> lots of music. Um, they both enjoyed listening to music, so I think I absorbed it in that way too. And um, I have a brother who's a musician, and you know, reading lyrics, um, reading those liner notes was a big part of my childhood right down to the copyright, you know. So I absorbed it that way, and they, neither one of them had advanced degrees. I don't think they thought of themselves as artists either, but they were big readers, and so that was always, you know, going to the library, and um, I think it just gets in intuitively, you know, you're just, you're, you're around it. So my dad's got a Jersey City accent, and my mom has a Spanish accent, and my whole family is speaking Spanish, in in the house. My grandmother was a big, you know, you assimilate, you don't speak it outside of the house. It's all right here. But yeah, it just, it gets under your skin. And so I think I was just fascinated with language. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's something that's really interesting to me when I read writers who I know grew up in bilingual or multilingual families. There's a, there's a facility with language and an, maybe a courage to experiment. And, I, you know, this is just supposition on my part, but I imagine that because they've had to um, express themselves and they've heard others express themselves in different languages, that maybe that gives them a little courage or survival skills. I don't know what it is. <laughs> to um, be a little more experimental with language. And do you think that that's true of you in your writing? Do you think that's true of the families in which you grew up? Experimental for me is something I do because it keeps me stimulated. You know, ah. it's like uh, you've done that. You, you're not going to sing your standards. You're always going to sing the new one because it's what mm -hmm. stimulates you. Yeah. Um, it's hard to put a microscope on myself and say, is that part of it? But I knew at an early age that I had a better facility with language than a lot of my hmm. equals in school. It's like it started to dawn on me that I was reading at a level that wasn't normal for a 10 year yeah. old. I don't know. Just because yeah. it was always there, it was always in the home and uh -huh. at my fingertips. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I think for me, um, like I was a I was a big reader when I was a kid, but it was mostly because I'm I was and I'm probably still to an extent a kind of an anxious uh, introvert of a human being. So I just I loved being at home. I loved reading, mm -hmm. and um, I just being um, alone in my own thoughts was uh, very 
very soothing and very pleasurable for me in a lot of ways. I just, mm. I just loved just spending time and I, I drew a lot and I, I played instruments and I, I tried to write stories when I was really young. And um, so I just, it's, it's always been around. I've always had that kind of creative output. As far as experimentation goes, I think um, definitely with Tina in a sense where it's like, I, I write mostly for myself in a lot of ways. And there's, I'm at the point where I feel like there's things I can do fairly well um, but it doesn't give me the same sense of curiosity or excitement if I mm. can just do the same thing. So I mm -hmm. feel like I have to try different things or explore different aspects of like my history or my, you know, my interests and things like that. Um, yeah. I see people's heads nodding in the audience too. <laughs> so I, I think that's something we can all kind of relate to. Michael, mm. you said something earlier about never really feeling as though you fully belonged in your younger years in Japan. And um, there's, Tina, there's a poem that you wrote, El Salvador, 1972, where you went to the country uh, where your mother had emigrated from. And, um, and, and I don't know if this, I, it, it, it seems to me that there's this sense of this child who culture shock doesn't belong also mm -hmm. and um and and it's it's partly uh, a, a cultural thing and it's partly an e socioeconomic yeah. thing yeah. yeah and so anyway would you read that and i um I don't know. I was so excited about this poem. I printed a lot of this one, so there's enough for everybody to have a copy. I'll, I'll preface this by saying that some of you may already know this, but especially in 1972, El Salvador was very much a two-class society. There was wealthy, and there was the very poor, and the very poor worked for the wealthy. And because my grandfather worked for the United Fruit Banana Company as an import, importer, um, my mother only knew wealth, even wealth that would have been ostentatious in this country. Uh, she had servants, they had a chauffeur, they lived in a palatial home, that's all she knew, and her family knew that too. They had come from Spain earlier. Um, so when we went to go visit, we stayed with my Tio Julio, and it was a big hacienda behind, behind gates, and um, not something I had ever seen before either, and we drove from San Diego uh, into Central America, into El Salvador to visit. So this is a memory from when I was eight, maybe nine years old. El Salvador, 1972. Wandering the high ceiling rooms of Tio Julio's Hacienda, I could see the row of coffee trees in the valley below the cliff-like veranda, the filigree of the wrought iron gate that stood 10 feet high between the courtyard and road, there were tarantulas to reckon with on the long stairwell to my parents' bedroom, lizards undulating in the blue light of the backyard pool, a colony of bats that lived under the terracotta roof and blackened the twilight sky. The maids tried to keep me entertained, games of jacks on the polished floor, breakfast plantains, mangoes, and fresh cream the color of pollen. I made a friend of the neighbor girl, her father, the foreman on my uncle's plantation. There are brown kneed pictures of us in cotton dresses and reticent, reticent smiles. We spoke in the language of children, physical and exhaustive. The outing to meet her family had been much anticipated. Two laughing girls swinging their way down a, rust, a dusty road. Entering her small adobe house, I found myself under the swinging eye of a single light bulb, illuminating a dirt floor. My friend hugged her mother at the waist. She smiled nervously while her father eyed me from the sunken sofa. Her grandmother waved me to the plastic chairs over and over, siéntense, siéntense. Four older brothers stomped in from the field, all swagger and sweat, ruckus and clamor. I stood rigid while rivulets of sweat dripped off my nose. A yellow dog pawed at crickets in the single circle of light, and the drum of my pulse 
rose with the rapid crossfire of Spanish ricocheting off the walls. Suddenly, my muscles cinched beneath my breath, and I burst through the unhinged door, past the squall of chickens and onto the night's dirt road. My sandals flung tiny stones behind me. Tendrils of tropical plants stirred on the black embankment. My friend's faint figure became a dusky outline on the narrowing road. Her mouth made sounds I could not hear. I was running back, back to my father's guayavetas, straw hat and old spice. Tia Tita's pointed shoes, the long stairwell, lounge chairs, servants, and cream, the color of pollen. Mm. Thank you. Interesting, this difference on, in both households, uh, completely unfamiliar, and um, especially through an eye of a child who can't really understand in the kind of... Yeah, I don't think I could have articulated what I was feeling. It took being an adult to go, oh, I was kind of in culture shock. Yeah. <laughs> the, the dichotomy between what... Yeah, yeah. and not yeah. sure how, what yeah. to do, how to... Yeah. manage those feelings. Yeah, and probably feeling guilt as well. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, understandable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, we were, uh, Tina and I and a friend were talking last night about even though one might come to this country and be a citizen, if there's the least <clears throat> hint of an accent, then, or difference in skin color or difference in dress or mannerisms, then these questions come up of, well, where are you from? No, no, where, really, where are you from, really? <laughs> and um, this idea that, and, and, and what our friend said was, the people who ask that generally, in the, at least in the United States, and, and he's lived here for you know, 20 plus years, been a US citizen that whole time, generally are people who are like me, whose families on both sides immigrated and we've been here for a few generations and so there's kind of an you know, entitled sense of, well, I belong here because my parents grew up, I grew up here, my parents grew up here, my grandparents grew up here, and um, where are you from again? Because uh, you're not like me and my friends who I grew up with. You know, and, you know, I'm saying this as an example, and I hope that I'm not the person who asks where are you from, really. But <laughs> uh, and it it occurs to me that there's no good answer to that question ever. And um, you know. I, I hope people don't ask that of indigenous people who live here, <laughs> who might dress a little I'm differently, <laughs> and maybe their skin color, or their mannerisms, or their way of speaking is a little different. Um, but ha ha have you gotten those questions? And well, my mom certainly did growing up. Yeah. What I, what I got is, what are you? What are once, you? Once they heard her accent, oh. then it was, you know, and. You know, when you're 10, 11 years old, you don't think bringing a friend home from school, by the way, my mom has an accent. I just want to prepare you for that. You know, it's just mom. Yeah. Um, but that got to be later on. I, I don't think I ever out and out said it, but when people discovered that my mom had an accent, she was clearly from somewhere else, then they would look at me and say, what are you? Yeah. I'm yeah. an American? Yeah. Did you get that growing so, up? Yeah, or? I did. Um, so when, when we moved um, from Japan, uh, we moved to Elk River, Minnesota, and it, it is the most like homogenous little place mm -hmm. in the Midwest. So there is very much like we were, like I was like the like one Asian kid at my school. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, there, there's that kind of separation between when you're kids, when you're that age, like nine or 10, it is very much a curiosity thing and the kids mm. are curious and they notice differences all the time. Mm -hmm. So it was like trying to balance out what was curiosity and what was this kind of inherited biases from the parents and mm. things like that. So you mm -hmm. had these kind of conflicting things. And mm. I, I wrote about at one point that some of these kids would 
say these racist jokes, and it was the first time I've heard racist jokes, and they weren't sharing it in a cruel way. It was just they were sharing it because they're kids, and here's a joke. And they oh, wanted you're... to make you laugh. Yeah, mm -hmm. here, you're, you're an Asian person. Here's a racist Asian joke. It's funny, right? And it, it's, such, it's a, such a strange place to be because, yeah. it, like I said, there wasn't a sense of cruelty from the kids. They just didn't know what damage they were doing. Yeah. yeah. So you have that, like, very strong ignorance, but it's also not a malicious ignorance. So it's yeah. trying to balance that out is... Um, was interesting. So I, I did get a lot of like, where are you from or what are you? Mm -hmm. I, being mixed, I've been mistaken for basically, uh, are you Italian? Are you part Italian? Are you part Spanish? Are you part Mexican? Mm -hmm. Are you part like, you know, Japanese, yeah. Vietnamese, Korean? Uh -huh. All these things. But, um, and for me, it was, it was, part of me was excited because I'm like, oh, you're right. I'm not from here. I'm from Japan. Like, so it was a way for mm -hmm. me to identify as being Japanese and still being connected to that. Yeah, you know that part of me. So, and my mom got the same type of questions, and of course, you know, the yeah. slow, loud talking and that. Yeah. Thing. And I was yeah. going to ask you a follow-up question about mm. that. Did I know that when my mom, she told me she never really felt comfortable in the U.S. until I had kids. So I mean, then she's been until here. you had kids. Yeah, until like really? your grandkids. Oh. So she's, I mean, she's been here for. Her very long time yeah like yeah. but she was like i never really felt mm. like i belonged here until you had kids mm. and then she just you know she felt like a grandma and she felt right. like she had her little home base here mm. now, and that made her yeah. feel good but that kind of sense of like mm -hmm. was there ever a sense of where well my mom wasn't alone i mean there she had aunts and uncles mm -hmm. already living here and her mother lived here and mm. so she had a real home base with her family your mom was okay. On her own, yeah, yeah in a very, isolated. very different place, yeah. I think the probably the, the initial shock that my mom went through was when she first got to San Francisco, to New Orleans and then to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. She went to a Catholic parochial school in San Francisco, and what she remembers a lot is the Irish girls snick snickering at her because she was really learning quickly to learn to speak English, first mm -hmm. of all, before Spanish or French. So I think that was her hardest time there. And, but she had her sisters and she had her mother and surrounded by cousins. Mm -hmm. So I don't think she felt as uh, adrift in mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Well, it's interesting you bring <clears throat> that up, Michael, about your mother not feeling as though she belonged here. Uh, because I, one of the things I wondered about, and especially after reading this poem, Tsunami, that I'm going to ask you to read, um, is is there an is there a sense of obligation about carrying on the stories the of of our families and especially as you know new generations come up and as the older generations begin to to pass away and you know how does that what what legacy or what op sense of obligation, if any, do you feel around that? And so anyway, I, I'm going to ask you to read the poem, and then if you want to speak to that, that would be lovely. Sure. Tsunami. <clears throat> Since she died gradually, I thought her death, like spilt honey, would be easy to manage. The viscous mess slow, controllable. Over the course of months, the senses one at a time went blind. The words next, each flung from her mouth, then shot as if by <coughs> skeet shooters, until conversation was impossible, until only the lone word water croaked from her throat. Then organs like shops in a bankrupt mall pulled down their shutters, taped up handwritten thank yous, now the flat line sings with the steady force of a tsunami. It intonates a note, escalates in amplitude. It overwhelms, not with precision, but totality. Street lamps in identical offices, trees with their frail leaves frantically paddling against the waves. All bodies transform to water and rubble when confronted with water and rubble. Listen, in the beginning was the mother, and the mother covered her child. In the end was the child who covered his mother. 
In all the stories I hold sacred, there is this blanket the color of foam. Thank you. It's beautiful. Yeah, so I, I always feel like a bit of a trickster when I read stuff like that. My mother is very much alive, so I always like I always do these like pre elegies. I always like imagine like what would it be like, and then I feel bad, and then I write things, and it's just like a way to kind of prepare for mm -hmm. the inevitable things. But um, I think a lot. You asked about kind of like um, what did you Obligation obligations too. and things like that. So yeah. I think I never really felt that when I was younger and growing up. I kind of, in a way, distanced myself from a lot of um, significant kind of cultural markers. I didn't speak a lot of Japanese. Um, like when my mom would talk to me, I'd respond in English, that yeah. kind of thing, same mm -hmm. type of thing. Um, it was always part of me, but I didn't really focus on it. And then when I had kids, it started becoming much more important to me mm -hmm. that they have some sense of like where we come from and where basically who my parents are. I think that's mm. the big part of it is not necessarily exactly about being Japanese, but more like I want them to know who my parents are. Mm. So and mm -hmm. part of being Japanese is who my mother is. So I want them to right. like mm -hmm. listen to the language and kind of know about where I grew up a little bit and know about both of their parents. So mm. it's, it's more about that and the cultural part comes with it. And for me lately too, it's been kind of a source of nostalgia and comfort. Like, I don't know if you do the same thing, yeah. but I, I've been listening to Japanese music and watching mm. Japanese movies I and anime. I was just listening and... to Sergio Mendes in Brazil 66. <laughs> <laughs> That's what mom used to listen to. Well, yeah, so you just, you get to this point where it just, it feels good to kind of go back to these things that you heard mm. as a child or yeah. that your mm -hmm. parents would talk about. and so. The, that's what I've been doing a lot lately. And so it's kind of rubbing off on the kids too, is that they just listen to these songs and it's just a way to, I guess, for them to get to know me and get to know my parents. So I think it's, it doesn't feel like obligation so much as just wanting to, as they get older, wanting them to know that their parents and their grandparents are these three dimensional humans with their experiences and histories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I can't say that I felt an obligation. I think what my impetus comes from is um, defending those that I loved. Even though I had a difficult relationship with my mom, some of the things that would put her on edge were when you could see people confuse her country with every other Latin American country to homogenize her. And I did this with my brother and sister too because I'd be with my brother who's half Japanese, and somebody, I would run into somebody I knew, and they'd say to me later, oh, yeah, your brother's adopted. No, mm -hmm. we have the same dad, just, you know, different moms. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's from China. No, he's from <laughs> Japan. <laughs> it, it, you know, and for my mom, it was, she would always say if someone asked her, I'm from Central America. She would hardly mm -hmm. ever say El Salvador <clears throat> unless it was another Latin, um, because it seemed like to a lot of Americans, El Salvador was just like Guatemala, and Guatemala was just like Uruguay mm -hmm. or Cuba, or and mm -hmm. they're very different countries with mm -hmm. totally different, you know, languages and food and and everything else. So I feel a little bit of an obligation to tell her story, to do whatever I can as an individual if I can help educate people that mm -hmm. it is important to distinguish these countries that are on the same continent mm -hmm. and um, and give give validity and, and credence to that. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, if I could ask you to put on your editor, publisher hats, uh, I guess I would sort of ask a little bit of the same question as far as, you know, do you, do you maybe not feel a sense of obligation, but a sense of the importance of um, giving opportunity for the stories and the voices of, of people in this country who haven't necessarily had as many opportunities for their histories to be known. And, um, and actually, I'm, I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, Tina, I'm going to ask you to read a poem that you published in your anthology mm -hmm. to countries, daughters and sons of immigrants, uh, of US immigrants. And um, 
Yeah, if you could tell us a little bit about it. Sure. Too, um, yeah, this poem, I, I actually solicited this one from her. I think I had read it on Poetry Daily and really wanted it. Um, the author's name is, we were just discussing the pronunciation, so I'm going to butcher it, I'm sure. Uh, Moha Kahaf, Moja probably, Kahaf. Um, and I'll read her heritage statement. It says, poet and scholar Moha Kahaf was born in Damascus, Syria in 1967. Her family moved to the United States in 1971, and Kahaf grew up in the Midwest. So this poem is called, My Grandmother Washes Her Feet in the Sink of the Bathroom at Sears. My grandmother puts her feet in the sink of the bathroom at Sears to wash them in the ritual washing for prayer, voodoo, because she has to pray in the store or miss the mandatory prayer time for Muslims. She does it with great poise, balancing herself with one plump matronly arm against the automated hot air dryer. After having removed her support knee highs and laid them aside, folded in thirds, and given me her purse and her packages to hold so she can accomplish this august ritual and get back to the ritual of shopping for housewares. Respectable Sears matrons shake their heads and frown as they notice my grand what my grandmother is doing, an affront to American porcelain, a contamination of American standards, by something foreign and unhygienic, requiring civic action and possibly use of disinfectant spray. They fluster about and flutter their hands, and I can see a clash of civilizations, sorry, see a clash of civilizations brewing in the Sears bathroom. My grandmother, though she speaks no English, catches their meaning, and her look in the mirror says, I have washed my feet over Iznek tile in Istanbul with water from the world's ancient irrigation systems. I have washed my feet in the bathhouses of Damascus over painted bowls imported from China amongst the best families of Aleppo. And if you Americans knew anything about civilization and cleanliness, you'd make wider wash bins. <laughs> anyway, my grandmother knows one culture, the right one, as do these matrons of the Middle West. For them, my grandmother might as well have been squatting in the mud over a rusty tin in vaguely tropical squalor. Mexican or Middle East, it doesn't matter which. When she lifts her well-groomed foot and puts it over the edge, you can't do that, one of the women protests, turning to me, tell her she can't do that. We wash our feet five times a day, my grandmother declares hotly in Arabic. My feet are cleaner than your sink. Worried about their sink, are they? I should worry about my feet. My grandmother nudges me. Go on, tell them. Standing between the door and the mirror, I can see at multiple angles my grandmother and the other shoppers, all of them decent, good-hearted women, diligent in cleanliness, grooming, and decorum. Even now, my grandmother, not to be rushed, is delicately drying her pumps with tissues from her purse, for my grandmother always wears well-turned pumps that match her purse. I think in case one, someone from the best families of Aleppo should run into her, here in front of the Kenmore display, I smile at the Midwestern women as if my grandmother has just said something lovely about them, and shrug at my grandmother as if they have apologized to me. No one is fooled, but I hold the door open for everyone and we all emerge on the sales floor and lose ourselves in the great common ground of housewares on sale. Mm. Thank you. Well, I guess the fact that you solicited it probably says a lot about whether or not you think it's important to uh, share those works. I'm, I'm aware that we're kind of running out of time, mm -hmm. so I'm going to ask Michael to read a poem um, as, as a, a kind of closing before we switch to the Q&A. And um, Rena Priest was going to join us and um, unfortunately was not able to be here today. And so I thought it would be good to give her the last word. Rena Priest is the outgoing poet laureate for Washington State, has given two years of her life to that <laughs> office. 
And um, she is also a um, marvelous poet, not just an advocate for poetry, but a beautiful poet herself. And she lives on the mainland not far from here. She is from the Laktemish people, um, also called the Lummi. And, um, and, and so Michael is, as I mentioned before, the editor-in-chief of Floating Bridge Press, and they published her chapbook in 2018. This poem is, I don't, this poem was written after the chapbook was written, but I'm gonna put Michael on the spot once again and ask him, would you please read Rena's poem? Thank you. And apologies in advance, there's uh, words I'm definitely not going to I'm really putting them on the spot correctly. there are words so. in Laktemish on here, so uh, not apologies to Michael, <laughs> apologies to all of the Laktemish people whose language we are all about to butcher. <laughs> <laughs> a poem is a naming ceremony by Rena Priest. What has grown out of what has gone away? The clear-cut patch has grown larger on the mountain. The rivers have grown murky with timber trash, and there is enough runoff cow manure to grow corn out there on the tide flats. I don't want to think about what has gone away. I want to meander and play and forget myself until I can grow a new me in place of all this grief. Learn the language to see the cottonwood as qualit ice the dancing tree, the killer whales as Kel Elol Meken, our relatives under the sea, the whole glorious landscape filled with meaning to end my grieving. When I was young, I was invited to learn Exwilingwexken, the people's language, but I said no. I didn't understand. I thought I wanted to learn how to be rich. I didn't know that the only way to possess all the weather of the world is by naming it. Here is bird song. Here is the kiss of a lover. Here is the feel of cold water at the peak of summer. I have spent my life with words, trying to name a hint of what I lost by not learning my language. Esther Thompson. To totest sen as to tem sen. Mm, that's beautiful. May I see that, Michael? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to share with you that there's a little asterisk um, after the poem, uh, a little addendum where she translates that last line, and it's I'm doing my best, I'm still learning. I'm doing my best. See how those words look. And I think that maybe is something that can be said for all of us. It's an interesting thought that um, maybe a part of existing in this world or to claim something of this world is to name it and, and that to know our languages is part of the ability to share our stories and and uh, you know getting back to what Tina and Michael have both shared that this the stories and our voices aren't so much tied to place as they are to people and and maybe that's how best we can connect as well um, thank you again Tina and Michael and so I'm gonna open it up to questions from all of you, or, or if you have experiences that you'd like to share about in terms of what does it mean to have a voice and to share your stories. Yes, David. I'm wondering what your reaction Less people but it's more the culture that the people carry and that you
you rephrase that? I'm, I'm not 100% sure I'm going to answer it correctly, so I just want to hear again. That what's so important about family and people in your lives, as I understood you talking, mm -hmm. might also be phrased as It's the culture that they carry, mm -hmm. and they, of course, happen to be your family, and so that's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, and, then, and then you're clashing with, you know, you're feeling like you're an American kid, and you want to fit in. And so, I'm all of those things. The opening, the opening mm -hmm. quote to here is, do I contradict myself very well that I contradict myself? <laughs> I'm large, I contain multitudes. And I don't think that's Whitman was thinking about me and Michael, but <laughs> it was very fitting, you know. Um, yeah. I also had the Japanese culture in my house. My dad had a Japanese catering service. He spoke Japanese. I knew Tomiko. Tomiko babysat me as a kid. So I had all, I learned how to use chopsticks while I was learning how to use a, a fork and knife. And yeah, all of those things informed who I am, and I can't think of myself any other way. I don't even know that I'm able to recognize it in a way that other people mm -hmm. might recognize it in me, so. Yeah, I think the easiest way for me to recognize any kind of cultural thing within myself is in contrast to other people, and I think that was the one thing when mm. moving to America is that mm. I, like you don't really think of yourself as something until you realize that you're not something else. Right, and I think that's right. been the big thing is that, and especially when it comes to like values and my understanding of like society or community it really clashes with this idea of like American individualism and exceptionalism or whatnot. So I think for me, a lot of that, what I inherited culturally from uh, my mom and that side of my family uh, very much is in conflict with some of the lessons of American culture, let's say, when I first moved here. And I, I think that has been one of my one of my biggest struggles, but one I fundamentally hold on to my Japanese side is that sense of community and what it means to be in a society and what is the individual function within a society. I think that for me that's probably my most Japanese part of me is that difference. And I think there's um, I think I get a lot of that from within that family dynamic too. I think my, my mom was very much about like, what can you do to best serve the family? Mm -hmm. And she was, I mean, I, my wife makes fun of me because my mom was still doing my laundry when I went to college. <laughs> like she was very much, to, I was the youngest. So, I mean, she babied me and I was definitely spoiled in a lot of ways, but that was how she kind of enacted being Japanese culturally in a way was that you are part of a family and you serve the greater family and she still does that with her relatives mm -hmm. in Japan and still very much takes care of like me and my kids and all that so I think just all of that kind of is like deep within myself. But you I were spoiled by a um, interpretation of a western culture mm -hmm. not I mean because as you yeah. said that, I said mm. to myself, yeah, but that was an interpre a Western interpretation that you absorbed mm. yep. because of your Western culturization, but, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, would that be spoiled yeah. from no. another set of eyes yeah. Yeah. outside right. of, right. Yeah. yeah. like I like I didn't realize until my wife made fun of me that <laughs> it wasn't a normal thing. Not, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and until you said that about the influence of, you know, and this idea of the individual <coughs> versus the family unit or larger, whatever you belong to, whatever group you're part of. It had not occurred to me how much the title of your latest collection kind of reflects that. So his latest poetry collection is entitled Empire of Surrender. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, I'm I, I kind of feel in my mind blown a little bit, like I'm viewing that in a very different way from, and as you know, I've read that collection many times, I'm very familiar with it, and 
yeah, so I'm so glad to have had this conversation and open up my perspective about that. You know, and I think that's part of the challenge that until we have these conversations, how do we understand? Mm -hmm. We're always looking through, you know, how can I help but look through the lens of a culture that says, wow, your mom's doing your laundry while you're in college. <laughs> that's, boy, that's spoiled. Yeah. How do, how do we learn to see through those other perspectives? Mm -hmm. It was interesting. I mean, I, I have a very opposite experience of having spent my childhood as a Western, in a Western family in a Asian country. Uh -huh. And to come back to the U.S. periodically, but was very immersed, even though I was with Western parents, yeah. the way we lived, we were very immersed in the culture and I spoke the language fluently and, and whatnot. And then to find myself not being able to assimilate into fifth grade, Mm -hmm. seventh grade mm -hmm. again in high school and in college no one knew I ever had traveled because I was living in a, mm -hmm. in a uh, North Carolina tobacco mm -hmm. town mm -hmm. and I was not going to say anything mm -hmm. because it was right. it, it would have challenged mm -hmm. you know whatever I was trying to establish you know for myself and but, all of those ages it's really important to conform and fit in and mm -hmm. isn't it, it yeah is. The, you know, it's not really until a little later that being an individual and quirky and having your own <laughs> sense of style but matters. But still being white and, and being expected that that is who you, who right, you are. Right. The assumptions I was going to say, it. that culture is part of who you are. Mm -hmm. right? And you have as yeah. much right to claim that as anybody else, but it's not written on your face. Yeah. And this is a problem in America all over the place that mm -hmm. we don't validate for each other. Right your experiences and your, it has to be written on your face apparently for it to yeah. be real, you know. Well, and both of you experience that if your last name doesn't reflect right. your entire yeah. heritage, yes. <laughs> then, oh, well, who are you, white person yeah. who knows nothing about multiculturalism, et cetera. You've both gotten that too. Yeah, I you? write about affirmative action forms in the introduction here and, you know, when you're applying for jobs and the way the way it was in the 80s when I was first starting was, you know, it was, I think it was white, Asian, African-American, and maybe Native American at that point. And then they started to ask about Hispanics, and my jaw just dropped. Oh, okay, here we are. But I can't do Latino or Latina without negating my German-Irish heritage. You have to choose. I, I just don't choose anymore. I just forget it. They're not going to let me say who I am, so I have to choose one or the other. I don't know, what What did you do when you were? Uh, I remember growing up, it was just other. Other. <laughs> other, other okay, I boss. got news for you. We are all other. other. All of us are other. What this made brought up for me, because of this whole idea of other versus belonging, mm -hmm. and whether that's related to place or to people, what I'm thinking about is how we often phrase that or look at that, think about it in terms of race, skin color. I was brought up with a handicapped mother, mm. right, who was evidently walked with a big leg, shorter leg, mm. polio. And I have a family member who struggles with mental illness. Mm. And so, you know, of course, that idea of being different, being other, being versus belonging, mm -hmm. and that there are so many ways like that's just another way yeah. you know, that we create distinction, difference versus community. Yeah. And so it's like, it feels to me like it's the largest question there is, mm -hmm. right? How are we mm -hmm. one? How yeah. are we mm -hmm. individual? And how do we join versus separate? Yeah. And that's the big and question. If, and if you're identified as other, mm -hmm then again, does your story matter? Do you get a mm -hmm. voice? Mm -hmm. uh, or the reverse, is your story more important? Right. And yeah, this Charles. Oh, I just was gonna mention that I, it had come as a surprise to me when we were talking with this, uh, that in the European Union, it's illegal yep. to ask people Anything about ethnicity, ethnicity yeah. or racial uh -huh. background. Yeah. And so I just find that very interesting. Yeah. That, you know, I say that in here too. I hope someday we just mm -hmm. 
ob obliterate it because we're all human beings. Can we first look at each other that way, and and go from there? You know, and I think it. I think it. You know, comes from a a, a well-meaning perspective for a lot of places. They are looking toward how do we create equity, how do we create better opportunities, and. Um, and so, you know, I, I, it's, it's a mixed bag mm -hmm. in a way there, you know, it, it, I think for most people it's used in a way that is very altruistic and yet it doesn't quite reach that. Hit the mark. Yeah. yeah. And maybe these are baby steps for us as a society. Maybe, maybe we need to go through some of these s attempts and steps to, in order to reach a better, better methods of, of having a more equitable world. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, well, we, and we, we probably is. can't answer that today. Mm -hmm. Sorry, the people. Yeah, Tracy and then Rich. Sorry. Want to put people in. Where it's like, when I ask you questions about, well, where are you from? What about this? What about that? Then to try to make a connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't where you're growing up. I mean, a bit older than you guys, but I think you talked a little bit about wanting to, you know, many immigrants, especially the, the new generation, get, Way, way back was like, get rid of as much as you could of who you yeah. came from. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've traveled a lot parts of the world, so to me, when I hear somebody and, it, and my ear is very tuned to accent, I'm doing it out of connection, just like you said, mm -hmm. where are you, have I been there, and wanting to connect in that way. But is there also, it's very funny, and I, I don't know if this is even true, I find that when I meet people who are multicultural in a certain way, I'm jealous in a way. Mm -hmm. You've got a richness, <laughs> that you're sharing, especially when I see they're in a group and they're connecting together, that white man here doesn't get. You know, we come from a certain, ugh, it was sort of that plain vanilla, but there's a richness being shared within the group that we're, that we're kind of almost jealous of, like, wow, you really yeah. experienced something that a lot of Americans haven't, and we're, well, judgmentally, I feel like we're so damn narrow because of it. <laughs> Your in family in did at way. one point, though, Paul. I mean, mm. you know, right. we're we closer to it because mm -hmm. we have that immediate immigrant yeah. in the household. But mm -hmm. everybody here came from somewhere right. else. Yeah. Yeah. So at well, some point, right. you did have yeah. your family. And my grandparents and, and, wanted to just yeah. ignore it, you know. Yeah. Not, you know and, I, and I think it's really important for us to acknowledge, too, that when we're talking about, like, cultures that come here and people try <coughs> to fit in and we become homogenized, mm -hmm. that the people who were first here, who have been here for millennia, <laughs> they experienced having their language and their beliefs and their culture erased. They were forced off their land. They, were, they had religions, you know, physically beaten into them in some cases, and many of them died because of that kind of treatment and children being separated from their parents and some outside force deciding for them that they were going to get a better childhood if they were on this, you know, this school property and, you know, really made orphans, helpless children who are under, not represented. And that in that case, where they didn't have a choice, it really becomes difficult and complicated, and there's a legacy of trauma there that, mm -hmm. yeah, that also having a little box and trying to make opportunity available is just scratching the surface. Yeah, you were going to say something. Yeah, um, I just have a little comment, and then I have a question for both of you. Um, I was born in this country, and I speak English as a first language, but I've been asked my whole life, where are you from? Mm -hmm. Or told that I am or Portuguese or Native American or Spanish or Greek or and I with all this surety they come up and I go. Like, oh. 
to go out into the wider world and, and travel more, because mm. I never did really feel like I was blending in that well. And I kind of felt like there must be some more. So it's kind of interesting opposite ex uh, experience. Yeah. Kind of wondering where in the world I did belong. Since <laughs> so I'm going to ask again because my hearing is terrible. Yeah. You were born here and then grew up. No, I was just born here. English is my first language. And yeah. um, people would ask me my whole life. They've asked me, where are you from? Yeah. Or you're from the East Coast, right? Uh, uh, you're Portuguese, I can uh, tell. Well, you're right. Yeah. You no. Know? That need to have to, <laughs> yeah, let me get right. what you are first straight, and then I can feel mm -hmm. comfortable, and then I can move forward. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. othering you uh, mm. based off of who knows what, right. that whatever their assumptions are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then what I wanted to ask both of you was, Yeah. Both of you, and that was just descriptive of experience, yeah. but some narrative story. And so I'm, I'm just curious how come you chose the form of poetry. A long <laughs> conversation about that. I think um, for me, it's more how my brain works. I, I love reading uh, memoirs and poetry. I have a hard time with fiction. Um, my parents read. All, all genres. Um, I think I just want what's real and what at, is at the core and what I can get really direct to. So I, I love that direct hit in the heart that poetry gave me when I read it. And so I was like, I want to do that. I want that kind of effect. Um, I'd love to be able to write prose, but I'm not very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I primarily write uh, poetry. I, I wrote uh, a little bit of creative nonfiction and things like that, but I still consider myself primarily a poet. I think I, I got into it. It started off, I, I credit my wife Lydia. Like um, I wrote this when we were undergrads. I wrote this metered, rhymed love poem thing the best I could. I didn't consider myself a writer. I didn't consider myself uh, really a, a poet, or and she thought there was something there. She just encouraged me to take a creative writing mm -hmm. class, and so I was introduced to poetry, like actual contemporary poetry, and I just fell in love with it. And I think it has to do with what Tina said, that kind of, not just like the precision that you can get in poetry, but that it seems this extremely like condensed, intense use of language. And I, I think that just feels more manageable and it gives me this sense of awe. It just seems so much bigger than what I am. And uh, novels can do that and short stories can do that in some ways. There's like this element of like lyricism or poetics to every art, I think. But for me, poetry is just kind of what I gravitated to and it just, I can't, I can't get over reading a good poem and I can't get over wanting to write a good poem. It's just something that I haven't gotten bored with. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. great. So I know we've kind of gone a little over. Um, one more question or comment from Kim, and, and then we'll go ahead and, and finish. Um, I'd like to just offer the opportunity to think about making other something positive and not negative. Celebrating otherness mm -hmm. and, and no, they're not all immigrants. Thank you, my dear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank I you. I think the language is painful. Yeah, and it's, it's like we haven't thought hard and fast and long. Yeah. I mean, think about how we're learning to talk about gender. We're not cutting it back. Understanding it. Stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Assimilation is racist. Mm hmm Yeah. Race is not ethnicity. Yeah. Thank you. 
I think that's a great note for us to end on, to celebrate other and to recognize that as a positive and that assimilation isn't the goal and in fact is a form of racism. And um, let's, let's have an expanded view of humanity rather than a limiting one. So thank you for that. Um, I want to thank the library again. I want to thank Sam Gailey and Woody Siskowski. Um, I want to thank Tina Schumann, Michael Schmelzer, all of you for attending. I'm Jill McCabe Johnson. I think I neglected to say that at the start. <laughs> and um, thank you to everybody who's joining from YouTube. If you made it this far, Ooh. yay you. <laughs> and be sure to support all the programs and wonderful things the Orcas Island Library does. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.